raise your voice when you speak. Uh, raise your voice uh, when you speak so that we can hear you clearly and so that you're audible. Um, there is a question bar to people um, online, and uh, Kelly will be monitoring that. Um, and so with that, let me introduce our speakers. Um, Darius Divansky is, uh, Dr. Darius Divansky is a research associate of the Center of Criminology. Uh, he's a social scientist who spent the last half decade uh, researching and writing about gangs in Cape Town. Uh, <clears throat> there's also more than 10 years experience carrying out research projects and evaluations in diverse international development and humanitarian settings. Uh, Central and South America has been there and worked there. Uh, um, South Asia, North uh, America, Europe, uh, uh, Southern East and West Africa. And he has published numerous peer reviewed journals and written features and editorials uh, for Al Jazeera, The Guardian, The Globe and Mail, and other uh, media. He holds a doctorate from Sewage University uh, of London. So, welcome uh, to you. We also have as a respondent uh, Major General uh, Vieri from the South African Police Services. Uh, he's the former Deputy Commissioner for Detectives um, in, in, in South the Western Cape. He's, he's investigated some huge prominent gang cases, uh, most notably um, the Fancy Boys case where 16 gang uh, members were, were found guilty. He's investigated the Stansfield matter. He's a witness in several other gang cases in Cape Town at the moment, and currently he's researching um, a, um, a battle that has taken place uh, in Namibia and the Northern Cape um, by uh, a group of um, people uh, led by uh, Simon Cooper, and uh, he's also appealing his case, his dismissal case from the South African Police Service. So welcome, Jeremy. Yeah, We've uh, put him under a lot of pressure to be here, so we're yeah. very happy that you you made it, and your flight is, is in. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to ask that all of us um, uh, just adhere to the protocols. Um, uh, for those of you that want to use the bathroom, it's outside on your right. If you leave the room for the females, it's uh, further up on the left hand side. With that, Darius, over to you. Perfect. Thank Thanks you for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for being here as well. I'm excited and, and slightly nervous to, to finally be able to, to talk about a book that, that I've been researching and writing for the last, well, I guess better part of a, a decade. Um, so I won't spend any time introducing myself as that's already been done. Uh, but just to, to provide a bit of background, I'm sure a lot of people are already familiar with gangs through the media, if not through research yourselves, or perhaps community activism or different types of work, but just to, to kind of set the context for the conversation that's going to follow. Um, let me get into this a little bit and then we can get into to the book itself. So one of the common statistics that's cited is that Cape Town has the highest murder rate in, in Africa, and it has had so for the, the last number of years, uh, one of the highest in the world. Gang related murders account for something like one quarter or something up to one third of, of killings, according to uh, SAP statistics. Gangs are everywhere in the city, but they're largely concentrated in the Cape Flats. And I mean, obviously, this is due to the legacy of apartheid, um, where people are using gangs as an outlet for belonging, for empowerment, for income, a way of accessing protection, dignity, you know, in places where social services might not be present, policing might not be ad adequate, community development might not be adequate. Um, and so, you, you know, you see gangs actually step into to the void that the state is often unable to fill to provide a certain form of governance, to provide opportuni opportunities for material empowerment, things like this. It's estimated there's something around 100,000 gang members in the city. Um, between maybe 90 to 120 gangs. But these est estimates are, are all quite old and gangs are constantly being formed. They're merging with other gangs. They're dying off. And so like it, it, it is a, a really sort of dynamic and constantly shifting and moving social ecosystem. And so it's not something that's static and, and nor are the lives of gang members as we're gonna see throughout the, uh, the, the presentation. So, um, you know, you. you 
then there's, there's different types of gangs as well. What we focus on here within this presentation is street gangs and to a certain extent prison gangs. So street gangs are kind of these larger gangs with organizational structures that might be franchised between communities. Many of you might be familiar with names like the Americans, the mongrels, the hard livings. You know, a lot of these are known to be super gangs just because the level of organization that they have they border on sort of organized criminal networks. And then there's many, many smaller gangs that may uh, survive on their own or may eventually get subsumed into bigger gangs. My book also touches a little bit on prison gangs. So 28s, 27s, 26s, historically these have existed in prison exclusively of the street gangs. But now there's, well now in the last, let's say couple of decades, there's been this melding of, of, of the two worlds um, for different reasons. And so you see, um, prison gangs actively recruiting certain types of or, or certain affiliations of street gangs, or you see actual representations of the number gangs, the prison gangs themselves out on the streets, either through something like the firm boys, which are associated with the 28s, or just outright as a representation of the number itself. So you may see a 28, a 27, a 26 spray painted in, in any number of communities. And this is the prison kind of coming out into the streets as the, the streets bleeds into to the prison. Um, one of the things that, that my book also deals with is gangs and gang-like groups throughout Africa itself. And so I do kind of a comparative analysis in my second chapter, which we won't talk about here. But there's a lot of interesting commonalities between those gangs and other groups that aren't necessarily gangs, but have often been labeled as gangs, either through a misunderstanding of what they are or the weaponization of this term gang to kind of problematize youth, marginalized populations, and then better attack them often through security forces and the police rather than kind of um, addressing the underlying social conditions that, that bring them about. And so what you'll see in different countries, whether it be in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe, or in any number of countries, is you have very similar social conditions that bring a, about groups that, that either are gangs or might be militias or might be sort of groups of delinquent youth, even terrorist groups to a certain extent that are all different but share commonalities in their use of violence, their opposition to, to their marginality and oftentimes to the state. So if you're interested in that, um, please pick up the book, shameless plug. Um, but what we'll focus on here is Cape Town, um, colored street gangs for the most part with uh, a little bit of, of sort of uh, movement into the number perhaps and looking at exit and, or sorry entry and participation into those gangs and then something that has been ignored in research is the disengagement process or the exit process from, from gangs themselves. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about the methodology very quickly, the street culture part, we'll talk about the theory that I used as well as, as participation in gangs, disengagement, we'll obviously look at, at exit and then we'll, we'll briefly touch on some conclusions. I have 20 to 25 minutes and, and you know, the, the topic is, is expansive and, and quite dense and I also tend to ramble because there is a, a lot to cover. So I'll try and, and condense it as much as I can and anything that we miss or aren't able to get to in great detail in the presentation, hopefully we'll be able to pick up in, in the discussion. So the, the methodology was, was qualitative. So it didn't focus on numbers and surveys, it really focused on speaking to people, um, connecting to, to people, connecting to, to communities. So formally, that was done through interviews. And there was a core group of 24 life history interviews that I did uh, that included males and females, although it was largely skewed to, towards males, different types of gangs, or sorry, different gangs, Americans, mongrels, laughing boys, ghetto kids, corner boys, other types of gangs were also represented. And the criteria for selection there was somebody had to self have self-identified as a gang member, spent years in a gang, and then had, had to been out for a year or so. Um, so up, up, at, at the minimum, a year, and some had been out for, for longer. Right. So to look at, at their process out and their experiences actually having been out of the gang and, and sort of what that was like and what it took to stay out of the gang, given the, the challenges that, that people faced. So in addition to, to those 24 life histories, you know, those were often multiple interviews. Many of these key informants I had known actually for years. And so their 
travails, let's say, or this their disengagement processes, I had actually sort of borne witness to as as you know a participant observer. Some might say even like friend on some level. Um, and so what you know that gives you a really interesting and I think important sense of, of how difficult it is to go through this process, something that you can't just capture by talking to somebody, obviously, right? You see sort of their day-to-day -day struggles and, and, and travails. And then that was supported and, and kind of underlaid by 100 or so other interviews to, that I've done through the years. And these cover different topics, not necessarily gang exit, different types of participation, gang culture, um, the way that hip hop was used, female participation in gangs. So it was this multi sort of perspective way of informing this very specific form of, of research. And probably the most informative part of the research was the, the time that I spent um, actually in communities. So speaking to, interacting with um, not just gang members, not just former gang members, but their families, the people that they associated with. And you, know, you don't really get a sense of, of what somebody's life is like um you know until you're, you're able to to engage that and not that i was ever to do so fully i shouldn't you know misrepresent that because obviously i'm a tourist in, in these environments and i'm able to leave whereas other people were stuck in you know insecurity and poverty and these sorts of things so you know my perspective is one that's limited but i think this gave me a, an important insight um you know that you get only through ethnographic research um and so you know i'm a huge proponent of, of that type of research and trying to understand complex topics like this and so the, the book is, I, I had to sort of the, the privilege of also doing some journalism and, and some op-ed writing around this and other topics. And so I tried to, to kind of transpose that style of writing onto this to, to not make it such a, a dry academic um, literary work, right? It, it's, it's meant to kind of be engaging and, and um, present people in, in sort of more full characters with with context and, and, and personality and, and life history behind that. And so, you know, hopefully that, that it did justice to their stories and it, it hopefully it makes for a more engaging read. So I, I'm gonna try not to, to focus on the theory so much, but just to, to give you a sense of, of how I, you know, the, the, the framework that I used or the lens that I used to apply the, to, to, you know, to, to this topic. So I looked at a, a subset of gang research that's called, that, that's deemed street culture. So street culture is, been defined in different ways. So it's been defined as the code of the street or the mindset of Lakura or, or craziness or defined individualism. But essentially, it's like a set of, of symbols, practices, styles, ways of speaking that are oppositional to mainstream culture and people's marginalization or exclusion from mainstream culture. And it's not exclusive to, to gangs and gangsters. It, it exists in informal spaces uh, where criminality often is present, petty crime, low-level drug dealing, but it also, um, and probably most prominently, is embodied by gang members. And so somebody that exists in, in, in conditions where, you know, they don't have access to services, they don't have access to steady work, they might be in, in precarious types of, of labor, they, they, you know, are living in situations that are insecure, um, they may feel disempowered. There's obviously a huge amount of segregation and, and racism in the city. They look to gang members as embodiments of ways of, of, of sort of succeeding, at least in the short term, right? So gaining income, respect, power in their communities. And so these are, are what, what are called cultural repertoires, right? They, they give you a sense of, of, okay, what do I need to dress like? What do I need to speak like? How do I need to act in order to access some of these things. And so I focus on speaking street, dressing street, acting street in the, the street culture section. And I'll kind of get into to this a little bit, although sort of very superficially, but it will give you a sense of, of what street culture is and how it's deployed by people. And the interesting thing about the street cultural frame is that it exists in many, many, many different contexts. You know, it's not just a Cape Tonian thing. And these are, are places with different histories, um, you know, different uh, national context and, and sort of structural makeups, but they have this commonality that you'll find these marginal groups that deploy very, very similar ways of being. You know, this, this creation of, of not just an identity, but sets of practices that run contrary to the mainstream, right? And what's interesting about this is, is that they 
because they run contrary to the mainstream, it, it, it creates sort of a, it, it reinforces somebody's exclusion, although what they're looking for is, is an oppositional empowerment. In fact, as, as we'll, we'll see, it kind of reinforces their exclusion from the mainstream and mainstream opportunities, job opportunities, integration, things like this, and in a way also sort of does that to, to their communities. So the theoretical framework that, that I applied was largely adapted from a um, French sociologist, Pierre Bourdieu. And so I, and this isn't something that I've personally done. This is a, something that is done by other street cultural scholars, but I tried to, to kind of like push at the margins of what, what others have done with this particular framework. And they've adapted concepts like cultural capital field habitus to the study of gangs and, and sort of criminal groups. So not to, to really get into the theory, but one thing that, that is important is this notion of street capital. So street capital is kind of the authority that you get, the material and social benefits of acting out through street culture and engaging these practices, right? So it's a short-term attempt to oppose marginality through, um, yeah, this oppositional identity that gets you income, respect, security. And it's easy to see how participating in a gang, you know, taking up, because a, a, often this is a mentality, or not a mentality, I should say, because that, that pathologizes it, but a, a form of practices that is um, focused around risk-taking, dangerous behavior, aggression, you know, like hypersensitivity, standing up for yourself, earning that respect. Very easy to see how this criminalizes you, right? You, you very quickly come into to close contact with the law, um, get a criminal record. You may be stigmatized by your community. You may be threatened by other gangs. So you might end up in prison. You may die. Um, your criminal record may prevent you from getting a job. You know, this is an oppositional stance that's taken for the short term, but ultimately something that is, is self-defeating. Um, and, you know, gang members are, are looking to differentiate themselves among the already differentiated or marginalized, but they don't do so by attacking the power structures that, that are responsible for their marginalization. So, you know, social inequality, lack of services, they attack their communities and each other, right? So people that are in the exact same positions as themselves, and that reinforces the, the structural marginalization that, that they and those around them face. And so there's a, another notion called, uh, or um, adapted from, from Bordeauxian theory, um, which is, is street habitus. And this is basically just the long-term engagement in certain habits, right? So the socialization that becomes embedded in, in dispositions and in how people act and, and um, how people around them respond to them. And it, it creates sort of a, um, a, a collective habit in the way that it's presented here um, that's difficult to break out. So what I try and do in my research is, is kind of pull at this idea of habitus because obviously communities aren't static. People have agency and you don't get stuck in gangs necessarily, although it's very difficult to get out and, and communities move on, right? And so we're kind of trying to look, going to look at, at habitus can, can be expanded, but not using this terminology because it gets really kind of academic and wonky and using, using more practical examples. So street culture has, has always been really, really good at, at showing how inequality, social, um, structural oppression gives rise to, to um, sort of oppositional identities, right? So as not to pathologize people and say, okay, well, you know, this is just like some, some form of wickedness or, or warm personality that's engaging this. This is often act, an, an active decision to engage in survival strategies that may be self-defeating, but in the short term are seen as, as being, you know, something that, that people might want to, to try in, in their particular conditions. Um, so it, it, it speaks against, you know, this, this pathologization of, of gang members that you see in the media, you see by politicians, this vilification of, of already marginal groups. Um, just to, to give you an idea of, of street culture and, and, and how it manifests, my, my book is, is written around characters, right? And so I have sort of large segments that explain people's lives or portions of people's lives. And so this is an excerpt of, of just one of those sections. And this is a, um, somebody who, who uh, these are all pseudonyms, obviously. So we'll call him Ruan. He was a, a corner boy, 
grew up in, in Parkwood, actually didn't join the Corner Boys originally. I think he joined the JFKs. Um, but uh, originally, uh, eventually, five minutes left. No. <laughs> <laughs> really? Give him some more time. And, uh, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. So <laughs> let, 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 me, let me get through this very quickly. So a few things to, to take away for this. This man, get, through, through his gang activities, he gets called up to, to Weinberg Magistrate's Court. He's presented before a judge. The judge tells him, he's like, listen, you have an opportunity to sort of defend yourself. And, you know, his response is, I don't give a fuck. I don't want to do that, right? Against what we would think are his best interests. But the way that he explained it, he's like, listen, I've got a reputation to uphold. The court, even though, you know, he doesn't know who's there, people are watching, the eyes are everywhere. And so if he was to sort of subjugate himself before the eyes of the court, it's seen as, as a way of attacking his reputation. And, you know, there are dire consequences for this in, in the streets and street adjacent places, right? Even though he knows that this is going to land him more jail time, um, is, is going to, you know, put him in prison for longer, it's a calculation that he's willing to make. I think what's important about this is that, you know, we have notions of how to deal with gangs and prevent gangs through our particular sort of social universe, right? longer prison sentences, more police, things like this. You know, imagine engaging a moral universe that's like this, and, and people know that they're going to prison. They may very well die. Um, de Deterrence-based strategies based around large, longer court sentences, where especially where people are sometimes seeking to go to prison to, you know, validate themselves by joining the number, things like this, get street cred in that way, aren't likely to work. Anyway, so we'll, we'll abridge that a little bit. So, the, the, as I said, the thing that I wanted to look at was how do people get out of gangs, right? So attacking this notion of getting into gangs is easy, but getting out is impossible. So what are the, the motivations? What are the modes of, of getting out? And so there was a common sort of set of themes that came up every single time that, that I was speaking to people. And everybody sort of embodied these in a, a different way, but generally gang life was set in opposition to something called normal life. And that was made up of family, work, religion. And here you can see two quotations of, 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 from people who are one or two amongst many that sort of give you a sense of what, what normal life is like. And I think, you know, it, it, it may seem sort of self-evident that people would go to family, to work, to religion as a way of, of getting out of gangs. But the way that they use this was, I think, really, really interesting. So not only did family and work and religion provide them with opportunities for support, whether it's financial, emotional, you know, just housing, things like this. I mean, work is obviously a way of, of gaining a, a sense of dignity, an income that you need to survive. Religion is, is sort of a um, moral code, perhaps, a community. But they were also ways of socially distancing themselves from their prior personas, right? And so what you need to, to do is this reputation that you built up, you now need to, in a way, destroy it, right? Act against it by engaging other forms of cultural capital that aren't street-based, so non-street capital, right? Um, and so just to not get into too many of the quotations here, perhaps, but domestic life was something that, you know, none of these are foolproof strategies, but they're things that, that their own gangs, at the very least, can understand and say, okay, well, listen, I'm no longer going to be part of gang life. You'll now know me as often people had nicknames, right? They would disassociate themselves from those nicknames and say, now, this is me. I'm no longer a gangster. I'm not concerned with guns, with, with drugs. I'm now concerned with care for my children and things like this. Um, you know, obviously, this comes with responsibilities. And so whether or not they were able to do this fully, and especially for men who are expected to be breadwinners, in their socialized masculine roles, um, you know, that, that came with also challenges, right? And so if they weren't able to get a job, you can see how these things interconnect, they would then very easily often go back to, to their gangs and, and, you know, the ways that they knew about getting money. I think one of the interesting things about the way that dispositions are formed after years and years and years of, of, of being in street culture is that you need to sort of undo them afterwards, right? And so you'd get people that would tell me that, hey, listen, like, there's nothing that the gangs where the streets can throw at me because I know all that. But like what I'm really afraid of is being trapped in the house with my family and my wife and being able to like navigate these really banal circumstances. You know, that, that is a challenge that if, if 
you've known a completely different set of challenges that to us might seem outrageous, you know, are to those people or to somebody that's not used to that really, um, you know, threatening potentially, right? So that gives you a sense of, of, of how these types of repertoires are used and, and some of the challenges around that. You know, professional life, I think, in a way, <laughs> speaks for itself. Um, finding a job was incredibly difficult. I think a lot of the, the people that I interviewed, well, I know a lot of the people that I interviewed were out of work, were in precarious work. Most of the work that they were able to get were through informal social contacts. You know, you're often criminalized. You're not able to um, engage the, the formal market because your know, criminal record drags or is dragged along with you. Uh, one of the difficult things about getting into a job is then subjugating or submitting to a, a type of authority, which, you know, you're used to being the boss, right? And so how do you come into an environment when somebody is telling you what to do, when you're not used to trusting people? These are things that, that were learned over long periods of time, people with short tempers, things that are, are sort of ingrained in a disposition over a period of time. I had somebody tell me they'd been out for, for about four years or so, and they were saying, oh, you know, like this is still somehow in me. I had this argument with my manager on the work site, and like I wanted to beat him over the head with a spade. And like maybe two years ago, I would have done that, right? And he's like, okay, well, I just left the work site. And, and you know, that, that was a small victory, right? Like that gives you a sense of, of how street culture is, is a choice, but eventually over time becomes socialized and, and in a way kind of part of the person. And it takes a huge amount of time to, to get away from. Finally, um, religion. Religion was also really interesting in the way that it was, it was deployed in that it gave people a... One, a sense of, of sort of control, right, in, in circumstances were really out of control, and it gave them a way of, of really signaling. I mean, th this is another thing that, that, that gangs understand is, you know, finding some sort of like spiritual journey. So it gave them a way of, of presenting to other gang members their own generally through a really sort of um, interesting set of practices. So gone are the baggy pants, gone are the earrings, gone are all these things. Now you have like, you know, your slacks, your nice button-up shirt for men, your, your, your shoes, which are nice and polished. Somebody comes at you with Sabella, and they're like, hey, horse, you know, Pagamiza, whatever. You come to them with a completely opposite type of language. You say, hi, my brother, how are you? And, and you know, you use that as a way of signaling to anybody that might be watching that this is no longer you, and you're, you, you refuse to associate with this sort of lifestyle, even in the most sort of innocuous interactions. Um, you can see from the last quote here that you have this, this idea that you must change everything, the way that you speak, even the music that you listen to. So gone is Lil Wayne, now you've got gospel now. I mean, to me, that's a good thing because I'm not a fan of Lil Wayne, but it gives you the, a sense of, of just how sort of big the change has to be, right? Um, in terms of conclusions, I think street culture, as I say, is, is a really good way of, of sort of countering the, the pathologization or the vilification of, of gang members. And then I think what my research tries to do is push it at this idea that street culture um, and gangs are a, a steel cage. You know, the, these are, are really exemplary stories and I think ones that are incredibly sort of motivating and... and um, you know, they, they show that, that you're able to get out. It's not easy. A huge amount of challenges. You saw some of them there. Um, we can get into many others in, in the discussion. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is what I, I tried to, to show with my research. Some of the, the, the different uh, policy and um, programming implications we can also get at. But I'll, I'll just leave it there because I know my time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very much for that inspiring talk, uh, Darius. Uh, there are obviously lots of questions that one has. Now I've read the book, and I think that you, you've uh, you've trekked a long way right up into, into Africa, and you've brought all of the, the the studies around gangs together in this particular book, which I thought was quite useful. And you've taken on some of the more established uh, researchers. So we'll talk a bit later about that. Um, my only thought at the end of the book was I I said. I wonder what Bruno Latour would be arguing about the book. But anyway, Jeremy, over to you. You've got 15 minutes. Okay. We will hold you to your time. You can sit. Yeah, right sorry, I've cut into your time. time. <laughs> I, I think I also read the whole book. There's a few challenging things that were posed to my, the way I believed it should be believed in the past or acted, but did not necessarily believe it was the correct way. One of, one of the things was about 
that I wanted to clarify, perhaps now that I have you here, the perception that, I'm not saying it's so in your book, that we have an approach to dealing with gays is actually not correct. I'm not saying that is what you're putting forward. But the policing of gangs, which probably I was in the forefront of most of my career, that did evolve into a kind of counterinsurgency approach in terms of the challenge to alternative to state governance in the areas, which was really the, a kind of thinking that came from a certain approach that sort of dovetailed to the older kind of policing approach and a more revolutionary sense on how we assert power in, 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 in areas where, we, where our constituencies are based. So the challenge was always seen that in working class areas, such as the Cape Friends gangs, are really a challenge to state power or to whatever you want to do there. And I was quite, uh, I put it in practice in a way. But what also guided that the, the area you cover about definitions of gangs. There was never a sociological definition that we were supposed to be a highly normative one. It complied with strictly measurable criteria, and we could tick everything up and call you whatever you want. Okay? So we would approach an environment and say, okay, you fill all of these ticks, so you are that. But, but that is the way policing works. We need a clear normative framework, we need clear definitions to guide it. So I think the, the challenges lay with the way the legislation is, because we operationalize that in practice. And the legislation made it easier for certain types of approaches to, 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 to be followed operationally or for that older approach to that. So I just wanted to clarify that part of it in terms of the book. But the other part, the stuff that I always believed in, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad this is the second time I encounter ethnographic research on, on, on crime and policing, that there's two particular characters that I think highlight probably the need for another book. One is Jerome, and I'm going to come to Jerome now, and the other one is Gavin. And there's a few things in the examples that I think into our further study, you know, the getting out part. I want to start with Gavin. Uh, then before I get to, Gavin goes and looks for a job in table wing. Okay, and there's assumptions we make, you know, that people would know have been in table view before in their life. Um, I've been in Nelson River, I think I only came to Camps Bay after I was released from prison and I, I grew up there. I've never been outside of that space for a very long while, except in Ethel to go to Tesco or to meetings in which was played. So, I mean, one thing that captures that experience and getting lost in that and not finding a place, it goes to a lot about the assumptions we make that with that is attached to getting lost. So, a lot of rehabilitation in prison often does not address those things. How do you navigate? Do you use the term white space? Right? Yeah. What was to you white space before? And I think that, that's, that's a valuable area for further exploration, but I found that particularly interesting. The two laughing boys that go with you to the waterfront and end up being questioned by security guards at every shop they go into. That is a common experience. That's an area of experience that needs to be looked at and, and how we address bringing in people from the Cape Flats into such particular spaces. And uh, I also suffered those before. You know, when you go to the beach and you know, hurriedly put the towels over there, the kids, you know, kids closer and those kind of things. That's a that's a type of reaction, I think. So there's a lot in the social space that needs to be addressed and, 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 and require further research. But it was Jerome's example that was to me quite interesting from a number gang perspective. Perhaps you saw it, but coming from where I come from, understanding the culture, there was something very significant that happened to 
Maduro when an inspector so inspecting the gang and the numbers gang is the good. <clears throat> so that is the person who knows everybody that was ever recruited during that inspector's term in the prison gang. And when this inspector confronts Jerome outside of outside, and Jerome offers an explanation, I'm with my family now and that is a very interesting thing the inspector tells him as he walks up. It speaks to what many suffer. And where many make a mistake, the inspector tells him, don't preach, just go. Now, many a gang leader in the Western Cape made the mistake of trying to combine preaching with halfway trying to benefit from the process and got killed in the process, you know? You know, the damage of shit stuff here and a few others play, trying to halfway stand on a platform and say, look, it's destroy the number, but in the other ones on the back end, you still want to benefit from that particular process. And that is one of the significant examples in your book of the type of challenge you face with a number. And really, I mean, it's an area to explore further. This all-powerful, almost ideological, cult-like culture that sees family as an alternative to their family and accepts it at that. But don't want you to be duplicitous about it. You, you should actually just be the other thing and stop preaching to other people. You're not here to, to come and convince us. Otherwise, just show us the example that you're something else. Um, so, like I said, there are various areas where you touched on the key issues that require, I think, what would be, would create space for much deeper study. I think the international. Parallels, and I'm particularly thinking of the Mungiki example in Kenya, where something has its root in political, almost like response in a neo-colonial environment. And now it grows from there. And what resonated with me was uh, the move towards gangsters seeing themselves as political leaders and uh, cultural leaders, and even proclaiming that they offer better services than the state in places like Mellonville, which is probably true, but anyway, that they're beginning to project that. It's quite an interesting case study to explore further while we're still in the very nascent stage of that kind of thinking becoming ideologized in, in the way in gang terms, in gangs like the hard living and, and uh, particularly a gang that I will be testifying on Tuesday. 20 members of the mobster, mobster gang who are guns for hire. We consider that if the one gang hires them to kill the other gang and not fight directly, they are actually a solution, a more controlled solution to the violence. So people are being, you know, the environment of high gangs begin to think at a much more ideological level to give purpose to what that is an area that requires quite a, uh, further research and the parallel with the Mungiki thing I found quite, quite, quite interesting. So those are just some key observations about it. But I mean, the, once when I want to come back to the, the ethnographic method, I've really learned a lot more from that than the old positivist kind of, kind of approaches and uh, uh, your, your clear statement that predisposition is not predestination you know, sort of enriches it with a less, less deterministic way of, of, of approaching the search. So those are just some of my observations. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I do want to invite um, leaders, uh, uh, sorry, um, visitors and, and participants to ask questions, if you have any questions. We have one on the, one on the, Thing already. All right. So, so let me see if I can just see if we can put it up. This out. And then we can have a look at the Maybe questions. Perhaps someone, if there is a question in the audience, take that. Take that so long. Over and yeah. Any any questions from uh, any of the participants here? I, I'm going to encourage you to read this book because it's uh, Zianda, I see you, Um I'm going to encourage you to read the book because 
I don't think anything like this has been done before. We've we've always argued about people uh, getting out of uh, the gang, and what I think Darius's book does is that lays bare that there are opportunities for getting out. Um, having said that, he also says uh, by his own admission that it's going to take um, quite a big um, task, uh, almost the whole of society approach to help people get out. And I'm, by your own admission, you say that in the book. Um, and uh, I think that um, all that he's doing is raising this, this possibility by looking at this 24 case studies. Uh, and these are not children that he's looked at. It's, it's the ages range from 30, 51 upwards. Um, in, in some cases, some are younger. Uh, but the point is, the opportunity is there. I see you, Andy. I'm the going. Thank you. Say, were you directing it too? And raise your voice. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> thank you, Darius. That was an incredibly um, interesting and insightful uh, presentation. And you know, I learned a lot about particularly the disengagement process through your work. Um, this actually, this question connects to uh, what Irvin was just saying about the whole society approach as well, right? So, uh, you know, these former gang members that you've talked, that you've uh, spoken about obviously did an enormous amount of personal and, and sort of uh, interpersonal work uh, to disengage himself uh, from gangs. But I was really interested if you learned anything or sort of observed anything about uh, uh, society's perceptions of them, past their, their sort of gang involvement, as well as that of law enforcement. Uh, so, you know, again, if they you know, run into law enforcement and uh, if they're judged by either the, the way that they still may dress or tattoos that they have or sort of any former uh, or markers of their former life. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I guess, thank, first of all, thank you for your question. Um, you know, I, the, the way that, that society judges, I think, also depends on, on what segment of society we're talking about, right? So I think within communities, um, especially within the territories that their gangs may control, there is sort of like a reluctant acceptance of, of people trying to get out. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of people that have, have said that they're going to get out, have tried to get out, and so it's a kind of like wait and see type of approach. Gangs themselves generally will let you try and get out, uh, but at the same time, they'll constantly be testing you over time. And so there'll be this, um, yeah, begrudging acceptance, but when you'll come by, they'll you know try and engage you in Sabella and, and, and these types of things. I think there's a huge amount of suspicion also from community members themselves. You know, you, you see high level uh, examples like Rashid Sahi, who you know has made it, this conversion and has like weaponized religion to a certain extent. And there's a lot of questions as to whether or not you know that was something that was um, a sort of a, a true. Um, change and there's lots of other people that have done this at, at lower levels and so there's stigma and suspicion from within communities I think that when I, I the, the example of Gavin is a good one about people trying to get out of their own community so you know tattoos are a marker of, of gang membership right so people being ashamed of the tattoos that they may have on their hands or if they're going for job interviews actually wearing gloves or if they're in sort of a you know I do sometimes refer it as a, as a proxy to to white spaces but obviously it's both a class and a race thing, right? And so um, it's this this confluence of those two structures, especially that look to you know vilify a, a particular type of person. So a non-white body with tattoos is seen as you know being suspicious in a Kansas Bay restaurant, or you know even in a place like Mzoli's where like I was, and it's only through the validation of of me. That that person is then able to, you know, to to go into a particular space, and that I think is a microcosm of, um, sort of a, a broader, I mean, one societal problem, but people's obviously experiences integrating into society at large, right? And this is where, touching on what Urban was saying, you know, it's not just a matter of, of you know, this idea of a change of heart and and you know, just grit and perseverance and all of this, but you know, if, if your opportunities for reintegration are, are closed off to you and you're constantly trying to batter down closed doors, then like, of course you're going to go back to gangs, right? So I think this is one of the things that ethnography is really good at is it, it gets at people's lived experiences in a very nuanced way, right? It sees these struggles, right? And it, it gets away from, from these positives under, positivist understandings of not only what gangs are, but what ex-gangsters might be and it, it kind of, yeah, it, it offers a dynamism and, and sort of a gray area that, that shows how long that process is and how long you actually exist within that gray area, trying to 
reintegrate into different spaces. In fact, um, one of the areas that you do mention is that when people do leave gangs, they're still hounded. They're hounded by the police, who still see them as a member of a particular gang, and by their own um, collaborators, and by the opposition. Um, I mean, you do mention that in the book, and, yeah. and so it's a very difficult uh, path to, to tread. Uh, but somehow there's acceptance that if you a keg group, if you um, a born again Christian, people kind of accept that, yeah. and that could be one way out. But they, that's what I wanted to raise with you, and I think we're going to come to the other question. There have been people that have been killed, um, that have left the gang. Sure. And I wondered if you thought about that uh, yeah. in the process of kind of uncovering everything that you've uncovered. And then we can go over to the question that um, Kelly's got for us on the platform. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I preface these stories by saying, you know, in the course of my research, because it was only later on that I kind of came to research disengagement, at the beginning, um, I, I was looking at gang participation, and there's plenty of, of people, unfortunately, that, you know, it's, I mean, like going through my interviews is like speaking or listening to ghosts, like people that have gotten out, that have like legitimately been out for years or a year or more, have like found one type of God or another, potentially been working, and then have just been executed at, at like, you know, in cold blood in, in, in the middle of their community. Um, or others that, that were just in the wrong place at the wrong time and because of their connections, you know, that the family has to um, one of the, the major gangs still, they'll get killed. So this is not to say that, you know, with the right amount of, of, of grit and, and whatever, you're likely to get out. You need a huge amount of luck. I think you, you need a, 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 an amazing amount of grace and, and yeah, the right opportunities. And then over time, people will, you know, your, your own sort of gang and the community that, that you're around, will be more likely to forget, but you may run into two foes. I mean, there's people, I remember speaking to somebody that I had known for years, we were doing this disengagement interview towards like 2018 or something like that. And he had been out now for four years. And like two days earlier, the police came like beating down his door at 6 a.m. Um, because of an old charge that like somehow came up in the system, you know? So like there's, or, or, or somebody that had been out for 10 years was trying to get a job at pick and pay and, and you know, the fingerprint shows that you have a criminal record and suddenly like you've passed two interviews, but you're, you're denied that possibility, right? So it's not an easy process. Um, um, and, and there's different types of challenges, including the, the, the very real possibility of death um, that, that you know, could befall you like pretty much at any time. Okay, thank, yeah. thank you. Kelly, can we see? So you had just been waiting very patiently uh... Do you want to, you're still, you, uh, yeah, there you go. Do you want to give it a try and we'll see if we can hear you? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Cool. Uh, hi, Darius. Thank you. This has been really interesting. Um, so I'm a friend of Darius. Hi. I just joined because I thought this it looked like a really interesting talk. So forgive me if my question is kind of, um, so I'm not a criminologist. Um, so this may be um yeah more or less relevant but i'm i'm really interested because this is kind of touching on a lot of points that i'm uh, interested in from my work around kind of informality and how it links to inequality and you mentioned that gang participation is in part a reaction to injustice um and i kind of have a question sort of around cape town's very extreme economic inequality that that, that you see and which I would kind of imagine that uh, would be a contributing driver to gang participation. So I guess, first of all, do you agree to that? And then second of all, do you also see that as an obstacle for exiting? Like for instance, um, I, I imagine like in a city that has more severe inequality, leaving a gang might sort of pose more of a threat in terms of like slipping into more severe poverty uh, or it could be, an, a, it be a barrier in the sense that people, if you leave a gang, it might be more difficult to sort of obtain the affluent lifestyles, lifestyles that you see around you, especially if you, uh, you or the community you live in has become associated with gangs and, and crime. Um, so do, do you think that yeah, inequality and extreme inequality um, plays a role there? And, and if so, what? Right, thanks. Sorry, Thanks, Thanks, I, I'm assuming I'm looking into the camera, not at the. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yes to, to to both of those. I mean, I, I guess they weren't necessarily yes or no questions, but uh, the, the the street cultural frame is is created, um, or, or what it's good at is 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 
exposing the fact that that gangs and, and gangsterism and, and different types of criminality are a, a response to, to injustice, as I said. I think one of the things that, that I should also say that was in the presentation, but I, I did include, is this is just one of many modes of dealing with that, obviously. You know, the vast majority of people in any Cape Flats community or any other marginal community do not get into gangs, right? And so this isn't something that we should paint an entire community with. It's just that gangsters are a very prominent example of, of you know, a certain type of conspicuous success and, and, and respect. Um, and so inequality, segregation, lack of, of access to services, again, is, is, is one of these things that, that you know, people um, look to, to escape from, I guess, um, and especially sort of the indignities and, and the, the lack of empowerment that come with that um, when they, they look to, to gangs. I think that in the disengagement process, one of the things that I try and get across in my book is that, you know, these, these aren't like perfect character arcs. In fact, these character arcs are stalled and abridged. And a lot of times, you know, people are, are trading easy money, even though like, you know, drug money is, is very easily smoked out and, and people often have addictions that come with the, the, the dealing of narcotics. Um, they're very able to, to, to make large amounts of money in a very short period of time. And what they're doing is they're trading that possibility, the possibility of being respected in a particular way, having a certain power for, you know, menial work at best if you're able to get it or potentially no work at all, right? And so you're then stuck living um, hand to mouth based on handouts from family or friends or really hustling for like a bar of soap or some roll on living kind of day to day. Right, where otherwise, like you know, where your your social networks are, and you know where to access that income, and so, um, yeah, I think injustice, and I mean, th this is why it takes a whole of society approach, right? Because these same structural forces that drove people into gangs are the things that they are still facing um, when they get out. It's just that they've come to the conclusion that it's better to live with a certain type of indignity um, and. A certain, and I mean, this is these are not my words. This is the way that it's been expressed to me. Um, without the insecurity, without you know the the necessity of, of having to distrust everyone, without having to to um, constantly be looking around your shoulder, you know, without the drug addiction, without all of these things. And so, I guess the promise of gangs is a false promise. It ultimately leads you into you know most people are not high flyers or or, or um, high criminal figures or gang bosses. They they live at or below the poverty line and our foot soldiers that are, are essentially cannon fodder for, for bosses that throw them into gang wars over drug turf, right? And so they come to to realize that and this is what they want to get out of. But what they come back to is, you know, a, a highly unequal and unjust society that, that doesn't really offer them a meaningful place. Um, yeah. No, th th thank you very much for that uh, uh, response. Uh, do we have any further questions, uh, Kelly, on, on the platform? I don't have any. Because I... Uh, uh, Michael McLaren. Oh, there is another one. Yes. Michael, go ahead. Great. Hi. Yes. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. First off, hello to the panelists and hello to Kelly, who was my supervisor for my master's a few years ago. Good to see you. <laughs> so my question is to Darius. And in research I've come across, I've, I came across an idea um, referring to in, re, in relation to gang involvement and criminal behavior, these ideas of adolescence limited and life course persistent um, behaviors. So in some instances, joining a gang may be part of someone's adolescence and it's an outlet for teen angst and whatnot, where there may be a lack of alternatives in a given community but this person may be less inclined to persist with uh, gang involvement and criminal behavior post adolescence. And then life course persistence being the sort of person who's more inclined to you know, be in for the long haul. Um, in the course of your research, did you come across anything that uh, would lend these ideas weight? Um, in other words, can you draw up a profile of someone who's likely to actually leave a gang post adolescence um, versus someone who might not be as likely and is in for the long haul. Thank you. Can I add to Michael's question, sure. abuse the position of a semi chair, <laughs> because some of the point, some of the characterizations or the factors that you raise are the kinds of things that life course criminology does, right? Those, those becoming a father, becoming a husband, 
as opportunities for knifing off from one path to the other and then sometimes knifing back. Yeah. So that there's a there's a kind of nexus there to, uh, to Michael's question. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, that that's that's a layer. I mean, I, I don't think that I can offer a profile because I, I just don't have a large enough sample. That wasn't really the the approach to, to the research. Um, but definitely there's, you know, like disengagement literature does look at, at life course development and social development and, and maturation out of gangs as uh, an explanatory factor. It's not one that I, I think is so applicable to Cape Town. It's, it's something that I think has emerged from the West. And I know I, I know that the research that uh, Michael's referring to actually comes out of Cape Town. And I could I could see it applying. The problem is that as you get into gangs and you're recruited, there's a, a sort of a cutting up point where you become an official gang member where, you know, you take a tattoo, which then creates a, makes you a target. And then usually that's associated with different acts of, of criminality. Right. Um, and that, again, puts you in, in confrontation with the law, perhaps takes you to prison, uh, makes you join a, a, a number gang, most likely. Um, and so all of those things are feedback loops that make it far less likely that you're actually going to be able to get out. So yes, maturation as like a single variable, I think is one that, um, I think that there's a lot of credence to. I mean, these are the, the types of things that, that eventually, as you say, you tap into with starting a family, getting a job and, and forming different types of pro-social relationships. The problem is that you're in an ecosystem that is in a way antagonistic to all of those things and creates, yeah. I see you frowning. Yeah, but yeah. Feel free to, to jump think, in, but yeah. So that I'll leave it there. I think part of the frowning is uh, from my experience in growing up in Elsie's drama. I've seen gang leaders who have a very good health family life. Mm -hmm. It is not dysfunctional at all. It's kept well separate from the rest in another area, and they function like like Colin, who had the family set up in Rondebosch, and its nephew. The one in Newlands, uh, where people are able to maintain normal families. So I'm not quite sure whether one can draw that nexus automatically or that becomes an alternative. Because I mean, I've, I've seen nothing dysfunctional about those families at all mm. in the way the way we can gay, we've engaged them. So I think I think there is a challenge in going up in the single parent household that we need to examine. I'm not saying generally it is like that. We probably exposure to a family beyond or going into a family is beyond what you usually were experienced to might there might be some lessons that that does make a difference in terms of your exiting strategy. But I think I mean it would be it would require a deeper study. It's not easy to assume that. From from practice, but I mean, if I'm dealing with a family as a unit, well, a few gangsters with very very good family, or even adopt other children yeah. into that situation, and I think, a functional family, the stuffy family is one example. Thank you for that, Jimmy. I'll um, come to you in a minute. For those of you that's on the platform that want to leave, yes, now uh, to uh, take a pause, yeah. to allow people to leave also in person. Yeah, and if people want to leave uh, here, uh, we find. If you're finding it interesting, you can stay. If you, if you have other appointments, you please feel free to, to leave. And for those of you on the platform that have other appointments as well, we will continue for a while still. Um, I see your hand. Uh, so please go ahead. Yeah. Can, uh, just, just before you speak, can I just, let me just build off the last point just to offer sort of a, a personal insight into to my own life. Like growing up, I, I lived in like the most benign circumstances possible. I was in you know, suburban Canada. And you know, my adolescence was exactly, I mean, as many people are, it was exactly that form of, of or that sort of state of, of liminality and, and, you know, testing the, the, the barriers of my particular social environment. And I did my best to do that. Like, my poor mother had to, like, pick me up at the police station and, like, all of these things. But there were certain guardrails that, you know, if I was, I think, experiencing the same things and pushed up against the barriers of, of you know, a community like Hanover Park, like, I would just be criminalized to, to the point where, like, there is, a, I think, a very obvious point of, like, limited return. It's not obviously no return, but I know, like, I, 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 I think that really informs sort of my understanding of, of some of these trajectories, especially through that space, because it is a very sort of common sort of universal adolescent experience. It's just, you know, where did you grow up and, and what kind of trouble can you get in and what are the repercussions of that? 
thanks. Oh. I'm going to come to you. Uh, I'll come back to the, the point that Jeremy had made, and then I want to raise something about your research process itself. Go ahead. Yeah, I can I stay. <laughs> After you. After you. Uh, there's areas I, I can call him now, my friend. I'm actually given in his book. And it's so probably it's to be as given. And as you can see, it's all about things and how you get it, how you work, and how you is. Today I can finally speak English. And yeah, I've been on the stage of Kayflitz for many, many years. I was born and raised in the United Cycle. Kayflitz is a grand in Island Safety Team. I've been the land that just brings in from the Stachys. I grew up in front of Bobby Mongo. And I was in the lifestyle for, for many, many years in front of Bobby Mongo. It's a young little boy. Yeah, and today I'm out. But I'm, I'm, I'm out, but I'm not walking in the moment, looking behind me. I'm walking with faith and I'm walking with grace and I'm walking with mercy because in two weeks' time I graduate as a university student. I'm studying in Musenberg. Yeah, I've achieved so much over the 10 years. I met Darius 2014 in, when I was in the rear. Down and out, big gangster, big drug dealer. Didn't even know how to say my name in English, nothing, everything. To me, it was just Sabela and Sabela and Prat, a different language. But for me being here today and to witness what he is doing, it's actually, a, like I said, it's very hard to get a job, especially if you're criminal. And as you can see, my body is full of tattoos. You can see I'm wearing like all gates today. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he got me a job in the city and it was a, like a nightmare, like it's written in the book. I didn't know what is the meaning between habanero and jalapeno. <laughs> <laughs> but today I understand all that. So what is written is not just theory, because, you know, he is, he's a PhD student, and, and I always break about him, and, like, and I'm like, hey, I'm the original PhD from the streets, and he's the original PhD. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. What I did, he actually came in witness of what I did and who I was and what gangster I was. He, he was there, like literally in the house. So my family saw it. So he didn't just write from something from he saw it. And over the many years, I always reached out to him wherever he's in the world, always guided me. How can I become them today? I'm on TV, I'm on radio, I'm on newspapers, I'm studying with international students from all around the world. And just from a little bit of hope that I got from him in Maria. There's another big major thing over there, just that guidance for me is one of the youngest drug dealers that you can get in Cape Fletch. It's like you can call whatever police, whatever. It was not easy because I was hanging out with those that you kill and you die and you love. And for me, it was just all about the money and all about the power which I had. But I think God, I'm out. And today, yes. I really want the house, I really want the wife, I really want someone, which I can see is just like around the corner, which is legal, which is not illegal, no more police, no come my door, no more prison, no more nothing. So if you want to know more, you need to get this book. And then you will find more. So yeah, for me, basically coming from the lifestyle was a terrible nightmare. My father, my brothers, my sisters, was a big drug dealer himself. Like he, he was there, he saw how we moved the things. And so he, he was literally in the heart of all these things that he was writing about. So for me to be here today, it's just a privilege, like sitting in a university, like I told him, I walk in somewhere like I'm walking in a palace, like in a Indian's palace. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. <laughs> Party for me now because I wanted to speak about you, <laughs> but in the book, um, and that's what I, I, I raised with you as, as your research method. You know, when I read that story in the opening introduction of the book, you were given a test. Um, they, uh, Gavin Lim had given you a test, and um, it reminded me of um, of Dennis Rogers mm. uh, joining the gang in Nicaragua sure, yeah. and having to steal women's panties and then obviously sell it. <laughs> and I, I wanted you to just reflect on that, uh, on your entry into that environment and uh, what was done to you as a researcher, how you entered, how you negotiated your way. And um, uh, again, the, the, there are also similarities with uh, Sudhir uh, Venkatesh's work. 
uh, of him becoming a gang leader for, for the day. You were under the protection of, of, of this gang leader. So maybe you can just talk to us about, uh, a bit about that. Particularly, we have PhD students sitting here um, and master's students that are joining us. That methodology of entering into, into that particular world, how did you negotiate that? How were you seen by other gang members? Because you write about that in the book. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, I have to, to thank people like, uh, now we know that his name is not Gavin. <laughs> Let's say Gavin and others for, for you know, letting me into to their lives and, and to, to experience, you know, the, these, these spaces that, that are obviously foreign to me and, and inaccessible to, to, to most people like me. Um, but, you know, it, it, that privilege, I guess, comes with like a huge amount of responsibility, I, I think. Entering it is one thing. You know, you, you, you can get into a community through an organization. Um, most are, are, are willing to have you on as a researcher. You, I mean, for myself, I tried to offer something back, and so I worked at a, a rehab center offering sort of, you would call them life skill classes, but like essentially exploring different aspects of people's disengagement, you know, through my own understanding of gangs and the things that they were going through in, in ways that, that were, you know, kind of more palatable to, to somebody who, Instead of listening to me lecture, we would like look at hip hop lyrics or like watch a documentary or like I do work in West Africa, so we'd watch a documentary on civil conflict. And you know, this was a really great way of one engaging with that particular space, but also forming relationships with people, right? Well, that you're able to to leverage and go into communities and use that as an entry point. And so I come sort of from the the school of thought of somebody like Nancy Shepherd Hughes. Uh, who did her ethnographic work in, in Brazil. And, you know, as a participant observer, you, you, you sort of, I mean, you are objective in a sense, right? But you're implicated in, in that particular environment and in, in, in your research. And so um, I think what you, I, you, I try and do is, is come at it from the most empathetic um, actually the most engaged perspective possible. And then, you know, when you present your work, let that know, be known to the readers so that they can make their own decisions in terms of, you know, where you're coming from and what biases you, you may particularly have. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. The, the things that, that I had to, to deal with, obviously, and, and navigate were, you know, presenting people's stories, one, in, in a way that, that you know, wasn't, saddled with my own biases and my understandings of their universe and, and the you know the ethics of their world based on you know this outsider's view who then gets to retreat to you know the comfort of, of his apartment in central cape town and then eventually gets go, to go back to canada but understanding that like you know you will make very different decisions if you are living in a circumstance where like people are on top of each other and they're constantly pushing up against each other um, and, you know, I think that that, that, that initial test that, that you're talking about was an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Like what uh, Jeremy was talking about with, you know, somebody going into a place like Table View and not being able to navigate it because they come from a different place. You know, I have a similar experience where we're hanging out in an informal settlement in, in Grassy Park. And, you know, it's, it's nighttime and, and Gordon just leaves me. <laughs> but before he gives me some advice, he's like, you must be a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it speaks to, to like that mentality, right? Like it, it doesn't mean that, that you have to be a bad person, but people will try and test you. Ed. Like there, there are just, there, there's a friction that's there. Um, and it's not necessarily antagonistic one, but people, you know, try and, and test each other. And so you have to, to, to use those experiences as a way of, of informing your research. And I think that, uh, you know, without those experiences, I, I don't think I would have been able to, to write what I hope is, is a much more sort of personal, empathetic, um, hopefully more human book. You know? Okay, thank, thank you very much. We've got a question from Amy. Amy. Amy, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm calling from, uh, hi. <laughs> I'm calling from <laughs> Belgium, actually. I work in uh, chemicals and had the pleasure of knowing Darius uh, prior. So this is hands down the most uh, interesting meeting I'm having today that I'm dialing <laughs> into. Um, so the book is on my reading list. I disclaimer, I haven't read it yet. I'm really looking forward to it. But I wanted to ask Darius, um, you know, I'm drawing parallels between the re-engagement of uh, gang members into normal society and the re-engagement of ex-child soldiers um, and ex-combatants into society during very like acute time-bound civil conflicts, um, you know, like the one that Darius and I were working in in post-conflict Liberia. 
So I imagine that the internal organizational structures of these more kind of paramilitary or rebel groups are very different from, um, from what you've experienced in, um, in Cape Town, Darius. And I just wanted to know, how would you compare the re-engagement if you could? Um, and do you think that it would, I mean, would it, would your findings in, in the research that you've done in South Africa actually be able to inform policy recommendations for these more acute time-bound conflicts where we see a lot of these international organizations scrambling to figure out DDR programs, et cetera. So just, just some thoughts on that because, uh, because of your past experience. Uh, thank you for that question. We're gonna ask both uh, Jeremy and, uh, and uh, Darius to respond to that. Anyone? Yeah, that's uh, the centering reference to the ex-combatant uh, combatant, uh, experience. I'm an ex-combatant myself uh, from the past. And uh, I think, I don't know if I'm addressing it correctly, but one of the things I read in your book is, is, is to understand the combatant comes from a very highly structured and once again normative environment and instruction driven. So you have this whole frame around you that cushions you and carries you through whatever duty you are called about to do. Uh, there's no moral reflection in that scenario. It might be ideological reflection and understanding, but there's no moral reflection in that. And suddenly finding yourself in a society where that it doesn't exist is quite a challenge. So an integration often involves such characters seek, like many of us, we went into the military, into the security structures of the state, and that is that is a beautiful bridge, was a useful bridge for us to 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 slowly destructuralize the you know the way we relate to the world. Um, so yes, I, I, and I think I think it's a valuable uh, a way of, of looking at things. And um, yeah, I'm not quite sure <laughs> whether it is, but in my particular practical case, I can say many comrades with us who came into went into from onto the way into the state security structures. That certainly helps. You know, we didn't just jump into nothingness out there in the civilian world. And the challenge is when we jump into nothingness without the integration process, then the type of things that you discussed in your book with uh, involvement in other forms of criminality uh, becomes, a, becomes a challenge that is to be addressed. Like the Munkiki example, you know, moving from an highly ideologized, ideologized way of, of looking at your own society and just being left out. So you look at new challenges in the same way. You can not take to take into some structural integration into society. Right. Yeah, I, I, I would echo um, some of those sentiments from, I mean, obviously not personal experience, but things that, that um, I've read. I think Sierra Leone is a, an interesting example of how, you know, the permanence of these structures, so the, the need for structure is something that um, has sort of a fluidity to it and the political economy of violence so how violence is used and how it's valued depends on what opportunities are available for people right and so it may be that you are a, a former ex-combatant um that then maintains that structure but now it's in some form of like petty criminality um and then that criminality is manipulated by politicians as a form of violent opposition against their political opponents. And maybe, so th this is research that's come out of Sierra Leone. And th there's a number of papers that kind of like look at this trajectory. And in the first election, the way that that, that violence was manipulated, th th these researchers say, is that it was harnessed for, or sorry, those structures were manipulated, it was harnessed for violence. Later on, that violence was, was not so much, I guess, palatable by the electorate. And so, in fact, they were incentivized not to be violent, right? And so what you're trying to do is use, you know, those structures as a mechanism to, again, gain some sort of benefits. The benefits that you can gain are dependent on, you know, what's available to you. So it's not that anybody's inherently sort of oriented towards violence or groups are inherently oriented towards violence. They may be so because they understand that island violence has a certain cachet and, you know, it's remunerative in, in some ways, but they actually might be incentivized not to. I think an interesting sort of parallel also with Liberia is that, or actually a, a, a disjuncture is that, you know, Liberia was a, a time-bound conflict. And so I didn't really study reintegration there, but sort of my 
anecdotal understanding of, of a lot of the integration processes were that, you know, it's something that, that obviously devastated an entire society and people were very sort of forgiving in some way and willing to allow former combatants to come back into the communities in a form of social integration, um, forgetting past atrocities. Um, because, you know, that happened during a time of war, that was a particular set of, of normative circumstances and coming out of that, one, society didn't want to go back to it, and two, um, you know, you have a completely different social context, right? And so it's easier to kind of leave that past persona. I mean, in the way that, that people try to disengage even here from their nicknames are like don't call me that right it wasn't just that one example this was a thread that ran through on a good like i don't know six seven eight people said the exact same thing like that was me and i still can come back to that person if i need to but this is this is the new me in my normal life so just some thoughts not not coherent answer perhaps but yeah, yeah thanks i mean i think it's an important de debate because um how do you make policy is there the potential policy with the child soldiers. And um, one must understand with the structure, uh, structure agency de debates that, that have emerged in the, in, in the literature, that in these countries, Uganda, in the times of war, and even the point that you're making, Jeremy, I think South Africa was an exception mm -hmm. um, because uh, we were able to integrate those individuals. Uh, whereas in, in countries like Sierra Leone, during the time of war and Uganda, um, and, and other uh, African countries, society was dead because of the war. And um, that's the point that Bruno Latour makes, that this, this issue of uh, the society with the, the normative approach to what constitutes society has changed and uh, the, the, the sands have shifted. So uh, I think there is a, uh, an opportunity to talk about how one deals with child soldiers uh, uh, going forward and what the policy implications have been. I think there's been lots of Debates around um, reintegrating child uh, soldiers, and uh, despite the fact that there has been um, structure to the to the integration into the into the child army um, as a whole. But you wanted to say something. Sorry. Uh, yes. Hi. My name is Tano. Uh, thoughts are coming to my mind as I'm hearing what has been spoken and what Doris is mentioning and what Mr. Vieri also brought up. Mr. Vieri brought up a sort of a legislation that was brought down and they in the ground, uh, they go in accordance to what was given, in accordance to the boxes, to the ticket. So whatever you would see, whatever things you would, you would pick up from a certain person, you would tick that off and that person will fall into a certain category that you guys have met. Okay. And then secondly, what I hear also is mainly the disadvantage for a, 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 a reintegration for a gangster who has come out of gangsterism and he has this thing that is dragging behind him called uh, uh, what you call this criminal record. So my thoughts around these two things is like the legislation and the criminal record or both of these things, they are what they keep a person in a state, like a person who wants to come out of gangsterism and is looking for a job and he can't find a job due to his criminal record, then at the end of the day, he will choose to go back to his own thing. And the other thing is this, like for me growing up in Mitchell's Plain, I used to, I grew up in an American environment where there's American gangsters there, but I was not an American, but seeing that I'm also associated with them and even the cops so far, they also saw me as an American. So my thoughts around there is seeing that Darius is bringing the reality up and he's, he's bringing the reality to the people that this is the thing that is going on. A lot of people know that there are people trying to change, people trying to do that, but they do not have the details. So Darius is like bringing the details, and now these things suffice us now. How do we go about those things? The criminal record and the legislation being properly put into place so that it can be also an advantage for those who come out of gangs. Okay, thank, thank you for that question. I, I wonder, Jeremy, if you would, would um, venture to try to respond to that, because what Darius is saying is, is, in his book, he's raising this possibility that uh, somebody that wants to leave is, is, is up against the entire structure of, of society who views the gangs in a particular way. Um, now, from a policing perspective, I know um, you can't speak on behalf of the police, but from your experience, it will be very interesting to hear how you respond to that. Thanks. OK, let me deal with it from my experience. Not that I agree with what I'm about to tell yes. you now. Um, but 
as an operational commander in most of these gang operations that I was in the past, uh, when I'm sitting with detectives who need to target, we must target things that are clearly defined. We cannot vaguely go around chasing people on the street. Now, one of the tools is poker. So the first part of it is the definition. Who in Menenberg fits this? Who in Mitchell's plane fits this? Classifying them. So you know, it's a little like in academics developing, you have a taxonomy, and then you look at the world and you say, OK, OK, this broadly puts in that category. Then I go to, I'll tell you how it works. I go to um, uh, the sections, section nine particularly, that tells me how I must identify a against got the group. Now I must identify. And in it, it is very clear. It says very clear one of the things, the statutes. Now it doesn't say whether your tattoos, uh, you're now a priest and your tattoos, uh, you got sometime when you were 15 years old. The clear technical technocratic criteria is what would define the action. The second thing in terms of section nine is we need to go to certain places where certain people with identifiable features hang out. And um, it so happens that you're living in American territory and they hang out at the corner of this street and that street. Um, we are also, in terms of that, able to act against those who associate at that particular point with that group of individuals who fit this description. So it would be so happen, you're correct. It does happen when you're standing on a corner and a few Americans are around. And somewhere in our database, that is the corner where the Americans hang around, that it will be um, also searched and be treated in the same way. So the challenge is not, the police does not behave except if they're corrupt, or except if they move beyond the powers that of the statutes. They behave, by and large, to the normative framework that is set. And one of the challenging things is POCA at the age when it came in 96 was significant, okay, in terms of tackling racketeering, in terms of the legal statutes. But when we came to the gang provisions, we drew on, I think, a disturbing example. It actually comes from the STEP Act uh, that was used in South Central Los Angeles to deal with the Crips and the Bloods gangs. It basically defined gang activity as street terror. That's literally what STEP means. So some of the, the, the other type of challenges that I have highlighted to you comes from that tradition. I kind of could understand it in the time that we did and we needed to, to deal and stabilize things fast. But a lot of legislation needs to be tempered with time. Tools need to be changed. And these are some of the issues that, that, that we do look at. And I think, I mean, I'm just thinking about racketeering. I mean, sometimes we are selective. I would have personally challenged uh, the Stellenbosch not and the racketeering and treated them like a gang under Chapter 14 also. Just the markings are different. different <laughs> but what I'm saying is that is what normative frameworks does to police. And operational approaches that speak to blanket sweeping to identify the individual. So I'm not quite sure in Manenberg, okay, in this block, there are five people and there might be 10 supporters of the agents. This operational strategy, we Cordon and search, and they, we are allowed by law to do that. A provincial commissioner can start this cordon of search application. And we all searched in three blocks in Manenberg. While we all well know there are about five people actually looking for, and there's about three houses where they actually have the guns. So that kind of security pratic approach that might sometimes be supported by the populace, especially when the people start calling for the army, they want them to step up this. Uh, creates a framework within which we conduct ourselves in that way, you know. And so, yeah, I, I, I have regard it is it is a reality, but it is a reality that the whole of society approach is not only about everybody, but it's, it's looking at every dimension that informs the way we act against gangsterism or any problem for that matter. 
and including the security dimension. Hopefully your contributions there will change practice, but if you do not engage us, engage at that level, well, we will police you in the same way as you expect it to be. I'm going to uh, hand over to Darius to make a few short concluding comments because we, we're almost out of time. So let me hand over to you, Darius, and no. I'll wrap it up. I, I don't really have any concluding comments other than thanking everybody who's here and, and interested in, in this topic and, and in the book potentially, um, and everybody that's obviously joined us online. But, you know, a special thank you to, to those that, that have contributed to the book, um, either by, you know, helping organize interviews, but, you know, more specifically to, to sharing their stories and, and actually, like, letting me participate in their lives. I think it was an incredible privilege, I, I, you know. My, my $7 royalty check from this book is, is not going to be much, but the one thing that I really do take away from this is, is yeah, the, the great relationships that I've made. And, and yeah, the, the, you know, those things are, are, are the lasting takeaways of, of all of this. So much appreciation to, to all of you. Um, I hope I, I did your stories justice. And, you know, the rest, um, everybody, thanks for, for your interest. Doris, where can people buy the book? Oh, yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, 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 it's available online. Um, currently, it's, it's priced very, very highly for, for institutional buyers. So I would encourage you who are affiliated with the university to ask your library to, to buy it. Otherwise, pick up the electronic copy. Um, we're hoping that a soft cover will be available uh, maybe a year or so down the line, hopefully with a South African publisher um, connected to, to that. Um, but that's something that we need to, to talk about still a little bit. But yeah, so it's available on Amazon and the publisher is, is Emerald, so also through their website. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so by way of concluding, I'm going to encourage people to watch our notice board as the Center of Criminology because we do we have further seminars in the course of uh, the year. We have, we're going to have one with Yander Stevens sitting at the back there, um, the author of the book, uh, Can We Be Safe? So um, I, I do want to thank all of you for coming. And to say ethnography is a wonderful thing because it brings to, li to life the characters and stories that can impact on policy and change policy because you look at it very, very differently. I even hear Jeremy saying that he's looked at this, this thing very, very, very differently from his experience. So please uh, uh, read the book and the methodology that you've used. I think it's, it's really uh, insightful. And so drawing the conclusions and where, where do we go to from here is that this is, I think, a significant contribution to our own understanding of how we view gangs and the people who partake in gangs and whether in fact we can actually get people out of gangs. So thank you very much. And thank you to the so, panelists. Can I also thank the, the Center of Criminology for organizing this, uh, Jeremy and Irvin for yeah. participating in, in the panel. Um, you know, a big thank you to, to that. I obviously couldn't have done that myself. So thank you very much. Thank you. and biscuits at the back so feel free to take a, a little something for the journey home.